to talk for a few minutes this morning um, about fasting. Uh, turn the person beside you and say, I can't, I can't wait. <laughs> but I want to talk about fasting and I want to talk about celebrating. But more than that, I want to talk about rhythms. You know, if, if you've ever stood at the edge of an ocean, uh, there's a rhythm to the tide when it goes out and it comes in. And if it only comes in, that's called a tsunami. Too much of a good thing is way too much. Um, so there's a rhythm to the tide that's beautiful, that makes it so spectacular and also makes it somewhat, in parentheses, I'd say safe. Uh, waking and sleeping, there's a rhythm to our lives that if you're awake too long, I mean, that we begin to do really weird things. <laughs> if you sleep too long, a body at rest wants to stay at rest. There's a rhythm to that. For those of you who cycle, there's something about developing a cadence. I'm sure it's the same with runners, that once you begin to push and pull on the pedals, uh, you want to work yourself in such a way that there's a rhythm that you develop, there's a cadence to how you're cycling that's, that's actually important. If you've ever gone on a bike and pedaled way too fast, that your feet just spin like a madman, that's, it's not a fun experience, and people laugh at you, as they should. Uh, whether it's walking or perhaps even pushing in a wheelchair, there's a rhythm to what it is that we do. Rhythms are critical. And one of the things that we have to be very cautious of in 2019 is our growing connection to screens, our growing connection to being connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, our growing interconnection. It's one of the things that it's eroding our rhythms in our lives. There's something interesting about being able to call up entertainment whenever you want it, but there was a rhythm before that now we're oftentimes we're losing in our hearts and in our lives again because even too much of a good thing can still be too much. And so for us to abide, everybody say abide. For us to abide and to follow Jesus, we need healthy rhythms in our lives. And in 2019, it's going to be a year like every other preceding year, and that there are going to be some highs and there are going to be some lows, and there's going to be a lot of mundane within it. It's going to experience those things in every one of us. None of us are exempt from it. But when you look at 2019, I promise you that there is a rhythm in walking with the Spirit. There is a rhythm in following Jesus. There's a rhythm in sharing your faith. There is a rhythm that God wants you to catch in your spirit walking in 2019 that you're not ahead of where he wants you. You're not lagging way behind and you're not just doing what you want to do. There's this thing called walking in the spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit. And it's not as mysterious as it sounds. It's developed in our disciplines, but there's a rhythm that God wants us to engage. And so for the next few weeks together, we want to talk about the things things that we do and the things that we do by not doing. And both of those things help us develop rhythms. But here's what I know. In 2019, you're going to find yourself not only in a rhythm, but you may find yourself in a rut. You may find yourself in a relational rut where you say what you say and then it creates a crazy cycle in a relationship. You may find yourself in a rut in your thinking, in your behavior, whatever it happens to be. And so it's vital at the beginning of a new year in 2019 that we fix our first. As Pastor Adam was sharing last week so well about you know, worship and surrender and generosity, that we really work on fixing our first, that if we give God the first, how I many know that He can do extraordinarily things with the rest? But if we give God kind of our leftovers or we wait to give Him our leftovers, we find that even those things are robbed, killed, and stolen from our hearts and lives. And so today, we want to talk about a supernatural life in Jesus of finding our rhythm in 2019, and we're going to start with fasting, and we're going to start with celebrating. We're going to start with those two things this morning. You know, Jesus, being Jewish, would have understood rhythms because their culture had rhythms built right into it. They had feasts, and they had fasts. How many of you like the feasts? How many of you tolerate the fasts? Hey, no, 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 no. No, no, no. I don't even tolerate them. I'm not even going to pretend. No, no, there's feasts and then there was fasts. He had times to celebrate, times to create, times to speed ahead, and then times to Sabbath. Again, they were built into the routine of an entire culture. I remember growing up, 
I do remember growing up that our culture had different rhythms. I do remember, I've shared this a couple of times a number of weeks ago, but, but I do remember grow, growing up as a youngster that most things were closed on Sundays. I remember it. I mean, some of you are going like, well, how old are you? I remember. I remember that. I remember growing up where I remember on Sunday afternoons in my house, naps were mandatory. <laughs> First and foremost, why were we ever so foolish as somebody had to tell us to nap? <laughs> Nobody has to tell me to nap. I do it willfully and joyfully in anywhere, anytime, any place. I will joyfully partake. If you invite me over, I will joyfully partake in a nap. <laughs> not saying your conversation's boring. I'm just saying sometimes I just want the Lord to speak to me in a dream, and I just want to present myself anywhere, anytime, any place. How many of you like naps? Those of you online, you like naps? Good. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah, developing rhythms. Developing a spiritual rhythm looks like this. Sometimes you do by doing. And other times you do by not doing. In North America, we're really good at the do by doing part. But we're not so good at the do by not doing part. And that's a part of a rhythm that we want to develop in our lives. You know, we do what we can do. We worship, we pray, we come to church, we engage. We do what we can do. And we trust God to do what God alone can do. When we try to do what only God can do, how many know nothing good follows? We do what we can do by trusting that God will do what only God can do. There are some of you today that you struggle with perfectionism. And it's not like you, you can say it's about excellence. It's not. Excellence is doing the best that you can and being okay with whatever that is. Perfectionism is rooted in oftentimes you never feel like you hit the bar. You're never enough, and I believe that Jesus wants to set you free. I want you to see something in the original story of creation this morning. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. And God said, this is day two of creation, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. This is day two of creation. For those of you who are in Bible school, how many days was creation? Seven. Some of you are so like, seven. If you're ever in church, it's just like it was in school when the smart kid gave the answer, just like follow right in behind them. You said, Evan, just do that. That's what I do. That's, that's how I got through all of school. You know, and if they were wrong, I'd be like, come. <laughs> Did you ever cheat off of a dumb kid? That's a lesson to learn right there. I had someone cheat off me one time, and I just turned to look at them and went, <laughs> <laughs> got a C. So did I. <laughs> and I worked for it. Don't cheat off a dumb kid. That's, that's, uh, that's, put that in your notes right there. That's good for school. Um, so it says that they were called seeds. And God saw that it was? God saw that it was? It's day two of day seven. It's incomplete, but God still pauses and goes, this is good. For some of you who struggle with perfectionism, can you work in the incompleteness of what is and still see goodness? Can you stop in the midst of whatever God is doing? For some of you, when you look at your spouse, and all that you can see is what isn't, I'm telling you, that's a recipe for disaster. When they look at you, when you look at a nation, when you look at a city, when you look at your kids, when you look at your workplace, can you look at the incompleteness and still see that it's good? Or can you only see where you're not enough? If you can only see where you're not enough, then Jesus wants to bring healing 
Listen, church, we are people of God's presence. And that's not just ethereal, that where God's presence is, it pushes back darkness. And some of you in your thinking need to allow the Word of God to penetrate your thinking this morning so it can push back lies and darkness and change the way you see things. I'm not saying you see bad things and call them good things. I'm just saying that you can trust that in the incompleteness of the creation story, God is still working. He's not finished yet. And I can still see that it's good. I can still see that it's good. A day was complete. Again, creation incomplete. And God seeing both says it was good. One day, and we'll fast forward all the way to the New Testament, Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. Let's dive right into now fasting. The topic you've all been waiting for. I know that's why you got up so excited this morning. <clears throat> Now John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting, and people came to him and said, why did John's disciples, that's uh, John the Baptist, by the way, why did John the Baptist's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? They're asking Jesus, well, why aren't the 12 guys following you? Why aren't they fasting? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, so Jesus is saying, as long as I'm with them, they're not going to fast. But the day will come. Everyone say, the day will come. The day will come when the bridegroom is taken from them, and in that day, guess what they're going to do? They're going to fast. And they're going to fast in that day. They're going to fast in that day. And so what Jesus was saying is that there are times and there are rhythms and there are seasons in our lives where fasting is an important spiritual discipline that you and I engage with our whole hearts. And we as a church, every single year, at the beginning of a year, from January 6th, which is today, until the 27th, That's 21 days, we as a church, whole corporately across all of our locations and online, we call a fast a time to set something up. We're going to talk about what you can fast, but we call a time for corporately we are going to fast, asking God in this year to do what He alone can do. We are going to do what we can do, but we're going to ask Jesus to do what only He can do. Now, rhythms involve establishing routines, where again, we are intentionally doing and not doing Discipline, I've heard it said this, that discipline is doing what we don't want to do in order to be who we most desire to become. That discipline is doing what we don't want to do in order to be who we most desire to become. And I say, yeah, absolutely. The problem with this definition and looking at spiritual disciplines, everyone say spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are different than natural disciplines, but they take the fullness of your natural discipline as well. But spiritual disciplines are different because they're also rooted around design, not just discipline. See, I love the definition of discipline. The problem is 100% of the weight rests on my shoulders to see that become a reality. But that's not what we're talking about with a rhythm. With a rhythm is, yes, I do what I do, but I trust God to do what only He can do. How many know that there is supernatural supply for us as His kids? In His presence, His fullness of joy. Not just fleeting happiness. There is more available in Jesus. Again, it's called the bread of his presence. It's walking with us. Jesus said he can give you a peace. Not that the world can give you. Totally different. Because peace in the scriptures isn't a thing. It's a person. It's Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. And so spiritual disciplines, yes, they involve us doing things like fasting, Absolutely, spiritual disciplines, but they also include divine supply. The scripture says that my God shall supply what? All your, not your wants, all your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these things. There is this supernatural supply available. Far too many followers of Jesus are only following him in their intellect. 
and not in the fullness of their experience. There is so much more available to us. It's what Pastor Adam was imploring us a moment ago. God, we want more of you. We want to experience your presence in such a way that it's undeniable that we know that you're here. Not just by faith and not just by mental assent. When you go in Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, when you're engaging with your heart, there is this space and there is this place of saying, God, I am going to trust you to supply. I can't tell you the number of times in my life Jesus has put his finger and asked me to do something and my first response is not a chance. Not a chance. Not because I'm being obstinate and not because I don't think that he'll be faithful but when Jesus asks me, and I clearly know that he's asking me to do this, I'm saying not a chance because what I'm saying is I don't have it in me. But I'm telling you something happens between your recognition that you don't have it in you, but he has everything you need. And there is this space and there is this place of faith where you stand in your inadequacy. You stand in this place of saying, God, I don't have it in me. And if you wait here, that's all you'll experience. But if you'll have enough faith to take a step of faith, you will experience supernatural supply in your life. You will experience what you need, but you won't experience it here. You'll only experience it when you take a step of faith. When you take a step of faith to trust. And that's what fasting is really all about. It is taking a step of faith to trust that God has supernatural supply for our hearts and for our lives. Fasting is something we do by not doing that's what it is. Fasting is firmly planting ourselves in the finished work of Jesus and praying for the unfinished work of Jesus, making all things new to show up all around us. Does anyone here need God to move in their life? Can I see your hands, please? Anybody need God to move in your marriage? <laughs> Why wouldn't you want him to be moving? Anybody here need God to move with their kids? Anybody need God to move in your singleness? Anybody here need God to move in your school, in your workplace? Does God need to move in our city, our nation, the world? Then church, we need to fast and ask. Fasting is, f is firmly planting ourselves in the finished work of Jesus and praying for the unfinished work of Jesus. God, I want to see you move. God, I've got an ache in my heart for your presence, an ache in my heart for others to experience you, not just the way that I've experienced you, the way your word says that you can be experienced. God, would you move in our midst? So a few questions. What causes you pain? What causes tears to stream down your face? What causes you when you watch the news or you see something, you go, ah, that's not the way it's supposed to be. When you feel that, you can rush out and go to solve that, or you can pause and you can fast and you can pray, and you can, yeah, eventually get to doing what you need to do, but also you can ask God to do what only he can do. You see, fasting is that space. What causes or what creates distance between us and God or others and God? Where is there death in our lives, our families, our world, spiritual death? What needs to die in your life for something else to be born that's better, that's new? Is it an old way of thinking, old belief system that may have served you for a season, but it serves you no longer? It no longer fits because you've outgrown it, but you just keep going back to it. And you may be saying today, but I just don't know how not to. Well, maybe you take 21 days and you do my not doing and asking God to do what he alone can do. Where is again in their pain in our lives, our family, our world? Jesus said, because of all of these things, it's important for us to fast. Everyone say fast and pray. Okay, fasting's not just a diet, or else we'll just call it keto, <laughs> or like a Whole30, or whatever other diet term I don't know in this moment, right? <laughs> you, do, you know what's a, do you know what's a great, great weight loss technique? Get the flu. <laughs> oh my gosh. Supernaturally takes care of your appetite. 
Ja. <lacht> no, no, we fast and we pray. We fast and we pray. We fast and we pray. And you may be sitting here today saying, I'm, I'm not really great at either of those things. Right. Fasting is something you do by not doing and allowing God to begin to move in your heart and in your life. See, fasting is not trying to twist God's arm in your favor. Fasting is when we see we should fast when the pain of what is in our world breaks our hearts into that place we should fast and we should pray. We should fast when we see that there's distance between us and God and others. We should fast and pray. We should fast when we are struggling to walk in obedience to do something that God is asking us to do. That is a great place to fast and to pray. If you have tried and tried and tried and tried, that is a great place to fast and to pray. Fasting is turning your heart towards God as our Father. So when it is expressed to others, it's about Him and not about us. That's what fasting and prayer is all about. So what types of fasts can you do? Well, you can do a full fast. Now, I would say this. If any of your fasting involves food, uh, you have to consult your doctor before you do that. Uh, it's an important thing to do, all right? But you can go on a full fast for 21 days, and you can drink only liquids, ju juices, or smoothies. I know someone one time who fasted everything, but they still drank coffee, right? <laughs> that person's my hero. I think it's great. But they did it, you know? I know someone who went on a full fast, and then they broke their fast by eating a steak. Can I let you know, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. But you can go on a full fast. Right? You can drink only liquids and juices and smoothies. You could go on a full, full fast. Take your full turkey dinner, put it in a blender and go. <laughs> you can do whatever. You can go for it, right? Full fast. I don't think that's the heart of what I'm talking about, but you can go on a full fast. You can go on a partial fast, which is known as a Daniel fast where you can give up one food or drink item, all right? You can give up coffee. Turn the person behind you and say, behind me, Satan. But you can give up coffee. You can give up tea. You can give up pop. You can give up chips. You can give up chocolate. You can give up social media. Okay, some of you need to fast Facebook. I'm telling you right now, you need to fast Facebook. We don't need another forward of that article. We don't need to see it. We've seen it 84 times. You need to fast Facebook. Right? We, need it. We, we can't handle any more cats with glowing eyes. We're good. We're good. You can fast social media, though. When you're fasting social media, you know what? Sometimes you're fasting as well. Comparison. Your soul needs to stop looking at others and comparing yourself. You need to fast. And you need to pray that you can see yourself the way God sees you, not just the way you see. So you can fast social media. You can fast Netflix. It's not going over like I thought it was going to go over. This <laughs> you can fast watching Ottawa Senator hockey games. I've started fasting a long time ago watching. <laughs> yeah, I've been fasting. I don't watch Toronto Maple Leaf games either. I've been fasting that for years, and God's been moving beautifully. <laughs> but you, you can fast sports. You, some of you can fast your soaps. Did he say soap? No, no. Soaps. Your shows. Your programs. So, some of you can fast Ellen. <laughs> right? So you can fast TV. You can fast social media. You can do a partial fast. So you could like fast from 6 in the morning until 3 p.m. You can fast. However you want to do it. But a corporate fast is something that we're all doing together. And you may be saying, well, what if I start to fast and I fail? Well, the first thing that is killed in a fast is perfection. 
If you're going to fast for 21 days, and let's say you nail 18 out of the 21 where you fast and you pray, how many know that's good? The first thing that's got to, thank you. The first thing that's got to die is perfection. What do I do if I, I start a fast and I fail? Start again right away. Just engage it. Because it can show you your own limitation, your own weakness, your own brokenness, and all of those things. And you can try to fix it, or you can ask God to heal it. You know what sometimes is surfaced in a fast? Is how strong a stronghold has a hold of your heart. And you realize, oh, this has a deeper hold than I actually thought. And in that place, you can begin to pray, God, would you begin to move in this place? All right? So on that note, we have handouts like this that are available that you can pick up. We have a prayer focus for every single day. You can follow us, or well, unless you're fasting social media. If you are, then you can't. But if you're not, you can follow us on the Instagram, on the Facebook, or on the Twitter, um, and we'll help you out with all of those things. So you can fast. Again, as I said a moment ago in Matthew 6, but seek first. Everyone say, seek first. And it's what we want to do. We want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things are added unto you. Right? Jesus shifted the meaning of fasting, not the importance of fasting. For Jesus, fasting is directly tied to prayer. It arises out of gratitude and it is grounded in faith. For us, here's what fasting does. Here's the, the byproduct of it. Fasting will make you more like Jesus. It's going to make you grumpy. That's okay. Let it get out of your life. Makes you more like Jesus and opens up our heart to hear Jesus in a fresh way. It produces spiritual resiliency in our hearts and in our lives. And it sets us up to step into the supernatural supply of God. And so, church, would you join us for the next 21 days, whether it's a full, partial, corporate, whether it's social media, whether it's chocolate, whatever it happens to be, whether it's pop, whether you're going to, you know, fast coffee or, or the whole thing. Join us for the next 21 days and watch what God can do. You do what you do while we, together we trust God to do what only He can do. And now I want to finish by just talking quickly and briefly about celebrating. On the 27th, when we end our fast, we're going to celebrate. How many of you love the celebration? How many of you hate celebrations? You're like, bah, humbug, I don't want to. No, no, no. Celebrate good times. Come on. celebrating. Okay, honest moment. Is anybody here ever find that you're overly critical? Can I see your hands, please? Does anybody here struggle with lying? Can I see your hands? Please? We as a culture understand how to party but I'm not so sure we understand how to celebrate. And as a result of us not knowing how to celebrate, we are growing in being cynical and critical. And so the, the plus and the minus, the minus is fasting. The plus is celebrating. Celebrating is firmly planting ourselves in the finished work of Jesus and celebrating how Jesus will continue moving in the unfinished work of grace in our lives. Celebrating is something we do by doing something. How many of you know it's important to celebrate people? If someone does something nice for you, celebrate them. Thank you so much for holding the door. You're awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Here's a million dollars. Just celebrate them. <laughs> Be generous towards them. It's important to celebrate. It's important to celebrate. This is one of the areas where the Lord has deeply convicted me of going into 2019. It is important to celebrate who someone is, not only see who they're not. 
It's important to celebrate, like we were talking about day two of creation, it's important to celebrate what the church is, not only see what it isn't. It's important to celebrate what your small group is. It's important to celebrate what your singleness is, what your engaged, your dating relationship, whatever it is. It's important to celebrate what the city is, not only what it isn't. It's important to celebrate those things. It's important to celebrate steps along the way, not just the destination. It's important to celebrate small steps. It's important to celebrate small victories in the midst of a larger battle. It's important just to say, I may not be, as Pastor Adam was sharing last week, I may not be where I want to be, but I'm not where I once was. And God, I want to stop and I want to celebrate that. And even in the midst of a trial, you can come in and offer worship because you may not be where you want to be, but you're not where you once were. And we can celebrate in that moment. Celebration can be as big as a party or as significant as sending an encouraging text. Has anyone here ever heard the name Bob Goff before? Bob Goff wrote a book called Everybody Always, and he wrote another book called Love Does. They've been doing something for 20 plus years, and I think it's just one of the most amazing ideas that they moved into a neighborhood, and every single year they throw a parade for their neighborhood where they just celebrate all their neighbors. There's balloons. They get their cars, and they actually have someone as like the parade person in the car, like the marshal on the parade, and the whole neighborhood comes out and claps, and they share. I mean, you know, that's a good idea, to celebrate what your neighborhood is. How many of you don't know your neighbors? Come on, come on. How many of you have lived somewhere for like 10 years, and you still don't know your neighbors? We, we got to get out a little more. We got to get out a little more. There's ways, you don't have to full of full of full parade, but you can do that. If you see something encouraging, you can send someone a text. You can send them some encouragement. Why? Because what gets celebrated gets cemented. What gets celebrated gets cemented. We combat a spirit of criticism through a heart of celebration. So much like fasting, there are different ways to celebrate. You can do a full celebration. You can throw a party, a parade, the whole works. You can do a partial celebration in the season. You can go for dinner to a movie or an event where you're celebrating your loved ones. You can send a card, a note, or a text. Anybody here ever receive a handwritten card? Isn't that amazing to receive now? It's an extraordinary thing. And then there's also corporate celebrations where you join with other followers of Jesus for a specific purpose. And on that end, we want to invite you on Sunday the 27th for a celebration to the end of our fast our heart and soul worship night together. And so we want to join, we want you to join us for 21 days of prayer, of fasting, where we open up our hearts, where we stop and we pray. But we also all along the way want to set up times to celebrate. Now, all I would say in closing is obviously if you set 21 days as a fast where you say, I'm not going to eat chocolate, and you get the end of the week, don't celebrate by eating chocolate. <laughs> like, celer- celebrate by eating something, you, you know, a nice celery stick <laughs> with like maybe peanut butter on it. Hooray for me! Right? Like, so don't, but don't, don't break your fast, but find, way, find ways to celebrate your successes. Again, as I was watching online last week, Pastor Adam was talking about the YouVersion Bible app that you can download, and it has streaks where it says that I, I've been in God's Word this many days or this many days. It's a little number that goes from like, hey, seven days to eight days, and you read it and you go, champion. You just celebrate what God is doing. Stop looking at how long you're not praying for and celebrate how you are. You may feel like you're only giving God loaves and fishes. He can still do extraordinary things with whatever it is that you give him. Find ways to celebrate. I'm not talking about overinflate your ego, but what I am saying is look at what God is doing, not what he isn't doing in your life. 